We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Wednesday. We had a busy day yesterday. Some interesting shit going on. Of course, we had Donald Trump's criminal trial going on. And leading up to yesterday, we had a lot of people crying and whining. The gloom and doom Democrats and the Republicans talking about how Michael Cohen ruined it for the prosecution. He admitted that he lied. He admitted that he stole money from Donald Trump. All shit we knew before. We knew that Michael Cohen was incredible. That wasn't the point of putting him on the stand. And in fact, anything he lied about had nothing to do with what the case is about, the documents. Anybody, every, Anyway, everybody was worried about that bullshit up until yesterday when the defense team decided to put on their case. They brought up two witnesses. One was a paralegal who was really just setting things up for the Next witness, the defense's star witness, a guy by the name of Robert Costello. Now, this guy claims to have been a lawyer for Michael Cohen, so he knows all the inside shit. He said that Michael Cohen told him that uh, Donald Trump didn't know what he was doing when he was paying off Stormy Daniels. Well, isn't that convenient? This was their star witness. Unfortunately, things didn't go too well for this witness, this witness behaved much like we thought Michael Cohen was going to behave, kind of unhinged, kind of hard to deal with, even though Michael Cohen behaved quite nicely. This guy got himself in trouble in the first day during his testimony. He was um, given side eye and stare downs and weird noises to the judge. And the judge, Juan Marchand, finally said, enough is enough, motherfucker. Clear out the jury. Clear out the media. I need to talk to your ass. And he did. He basically suggested that what he was doing was uh, contempt of court and that he would be in some serious trouble if he continued down this fucking path. Now, he did this without the jury in front, uh, uh, up front and watching this, but the jury did see the bit of a problem between the judge and this witness. And that pretty much discredits a witness to the jury, and that's their only witness. Now, you're worried about Michael Cohen. This motherfucker ruined it for um, for Donald Trump, but it didn't end there because, you see, yesterday he was back on, and um, he was under cross-examination from the prosecution. The prosecution knew exactly who this motherfucker was, asked the right questions, exposed the right things, and he wasn't feeling that either. He was kind of contemptible yesterday as well. Now, the judge didn't kick him out or find him in uh, contempt of court, but it did expose a lot. Again, he showed his true colors, his behavior. This isn't going to work well with the jury. They aren't going to like this motherfucker. And then they question his credibility. You see, he was never Michael Cohen's lawyer. He was approaching Michael Cohen about the prospect of being his lawyer, but Michael Cohen never hired him. And then through some emails that were exposed, we found out that he was in cahoots with uh, Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump. They were trying to get him on board so they could control him. Isn't that interesting? Now that takes whatever this guy says and throws that shit out the window because he's not trustworthy. He's a grimy piece of shit. I don't know what he used to do, but he is a shyster lawyer now. So as much as people were worried about Michael Cohen, this guy did more damage to the defense team than you can fucking imagine. So now they're going to do the summations, the closing arguments on Tuesday of next week, because, of course, it's a holiday weekend. That should take about a day, and then there's going to be about an hour giving jury instructions. They're kind of working that out now. What are they going to instruct the jury to do? Both defense and the prosecution will get together with the judge, and they will figure that out. But after the jury instructions, after that hour to do that, then the jury is going to get the case, go into deliberations, and come up with an answer. So theoretically, we could come up with a verdict by next week. Now, people keep coming to my page and they keep saying, oh, Mike, these are Trump fucks. He's going to get off. Some Democrats, too. He's going to get off. You really think he's going to run the run the table on 34 charges? It's just not going to happen. 34 charges are 34 documents that prove 
he did what he did. Donald Trump is most certainly going to get convicted. Donald Trump is going to freak the fuck out because he's never been held accountable to this extent. And no matter what trouble he gets in, he always thinks he can weasel his way out. But you can't weasel your way out of a conviction. Oh, yeah, you can appeal it. That may take some time down the road. But the real problem for Donald Trump isn't going to jail or the appeal. It's getting that conviction right now. From that point on, he's a convicted felon. And he has to deal with that. The Republicans have to deal with that. The voters have to deal with that. And telling you right now, that's going to change everything. We'll talk more about that, of course. But uh, we've got some emails to get to first. Uh, first, uh, first off, it says, hello, Boomer, longtime listener from uh, Chicago. Actually, I don't know if this is a... <laughs> um, a, a misprint or not. I think it's a misprint, but it says long time listoner. I don't know if that's a commentary on you, buddy, but uh, that's how I read it. Anyway, he's from Chicago. The other day I was in a different creator's live and good old fashioned dipshit HVAC Jeff pops in. He's now trying to grift on the left saying he's no longer a Trump I called bullshit, so did the creator. I just don't get it, man. Anyway, keep doing what you're doing. Love the show. Thank you. Uh, Derek, OPS, oh, I'm a Gen Xer. And he's talking about HVAC Jeff. You remember he was on the show one time. We had a little kerfuffle on TikTok. He was a Trump fuck. I had him on the show, and uh, he didn't do well. He didn't do well. And then he asked me to be on one of his lives, which I did do. And I was going to get blown out of there with complaints. So when I was dropped out of it, I just never went back. And he kept trying to encourage me to come back. And I realized very quickly what HVAC Jeff was trying to do. He didn't give a fuck about politics. He didn't give a fuck about Trump or the Democrats or anything like that. He was just trying to come up with a way to get viewers, to get um, followers. He was hungry to be TikTok famous, apparently. And I told him that. I said, you know, Jeff, you, you don't come off as authentic. The way you do these debates and all this stuff is just talking in circles. You don't have any point of view. You don't have any facts that you're relying on. And he had denied that, of course. And then one time I come across one of his lives and I see he's changed the name, his name. And ironically, it's now Rational uh, Debater. <laughs> so now, because I won't go on a show, he's trying to uh, cash in on part of my name and going Democratic. This guy is a dirtball. Anybody who listens to them is wasting their fucking time. All right. Next one comes from Javier from the sucky South Texas area. I just about gave up, Boomer. This asshole, dirty diaper, orange bitch is so freaking lucky. So many charges coming out of his ass. Senator Menendez already has a trial day and he's going to get hung. Depressing to the maximum. I wish I had your enthusiasm and hopes, but all but losses in my opinion. What are your thoughts? Will we have a guilty uh, guilty consequences on his trial, if any. Well, Javier, he's in the middle of a trial now. The trial is coming to end. He will get convicted. There's no question. Got to keep up with this here, Javier. Um, yeah, he's on trial right now. They just finished the evidence part of it. They're going to have the final arguments, and then the jury will go to, into deliberations, and they will come up with guilty charges. So, just relax. It's coming. And remember, the Menendez did happen some time back. Uh, it seems like it's quick because we're not paying attention to Menendez. Donald Trump sucks up all the oxygen and um, we don't remember things. You know, imagine this, a senator on trial for bribery and it doesn't even come up in the news. That would have never happened at any other time other than the time we have Donald Trump, again, sucking up all the oxygen oxygen. Javier, just relax. He's on trial now. It's almost over and there will be convictions. So you can feel relieved about that. 
All right. The next emailer says, uh, dear Boomer, I don't know how you do it. You always seem to get good guests on your podcast. Janice is a great, is great. Please have her on again. She can be one of your regular lineups. She's smart, funny, insightful, and engaging. It was a great episode. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. It's great to hear from people on the other side of the country. I'm in Washington state, which is solidly blue, but people like Jace, Eric, and Janice are blue dots in a red sea. We need to spread those uh, dots wider and wider. Your work continues, sir. I can't wait for next week's verdict for dumpy Trump. Rhonda. Well, honestly, Rhonda, when it comes to the guest, I'm not doing anything. It's the listeners and the quality of the listeners and the quality of the listeners that want to come on. Uh, I don't do anything. I just say, come on. We click the button and we start to talk. You know, I try to lead them down the right paths and stuff like that. But I've been very fortunate that these people are bright, articulate, and they make it interesting. Um, never really had a problem with any of the listeners. Um, and, that's why I'm always looking for more. Rhonda, you could come on. Any other folks can come on. We're getting more and more people coming on now, so it's a little tighter to schedule it, but we'll always find a way to schedule it. I mean, I think you'll t if you talk to some of the listeners that have been on the show, um, you'll find out that somebody says to me in an email, um, I'm l thinking about being on the show. I said, great, let's do it tonight. If I've got an opening and I don't already have a guest, I'll put you on that day if you want to put come on. And I have been lucky. We've been lucky with the with the listeners that have come on the show. They've all been very good. And in as far as regulars, I never really plan to have regulars. Old Soul is just one of those special things that we try to have her on as much as possible, and it works out every week. Ed, too, Ed's a different circumstance. He's not so much a listener as an old friend of mine. And I know that if I go on to a show with him, it's going to be very easy to do. And it's going to be very good. And he's going to make me look good. So uh, he's generally on a weekly basis. But in the last couple of months, we've been missing each other. Uh, he wasn't on last week. I'm hoping he's on this week. All right. The next email says, good morning, Mike. I listened to the podcast this morning with Janice. She mentioned some clients who are complaining how the economy sucks, but their portfolios are paying off better <clears throat> than ever. The way to bring them back to reality is with one simple question. You have a choice. Would you rather pay less for goods you want and make less on your investments or pay more at the store and earn a lot more in your investments? Pick one because you can't have both. My money is the majority will choose option two. Stephanie. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Everybody wants it all and doesn't want to pay a price for for their their good fortune. My my brother said something to me one time. He said, um, some people aren't happy unless they're miserable. Some people want to continually complain. They want to bitch about something. They want to be the victim. We know Donald Trump does it, but a lot of people who aren't narcissists do this too. And it goes back to what I've said before. Too many people look at negative things when they get up in the morning and that's all they think. That's all they consider. And that's all they get because they're focused on that. Focus on the positive. There's always positives. How do I know that? Well, when you listen to TikTok or the podcast. We hear all these negative things on in the media, and then we talk about them here or on TikTok. And the fact of the matter is, is if you really look at a situation, there's always an angle to every situation. There's always a bright spot. There's always a, a, an angle or some hope in there. If you're not looking for hope, you're not going to find fucking hope. So don't whine to me if everything's terrible because you're not doing your job. All right. The next one says, hi, Mike Irwin from Belgium here. Actual Belgium. I wonder if it's possible for you to podcastify your short videos that are on YouTube and on TikTok. Your long podcast I listen to on my podcast app. I would love to hear the short ones too. Just a request. Thanks, Irwin. Well, Irwin, prior to doing this show, I was looking into that. And it looks like I can do that. 
So what he's basically saying is taking the TikTok videos that are two or three minutes long and then putting them together and releasing them in audio format here. I mean, if you want to see the videos of the TikToks, you can go to TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram. Those videos are already there. Uh, there is a way to extract the audio and put it together kind of like a short version of the podcast and put it up in the audio podcast platform. <clears throat> so I, I, I figured out how to do it. And I may give that a try tomorrow or whatever. And if people are interested in it, I'm happy to do it. It's not a big deal. So Erwin, thank you for the good suggestion. And I will give it a shot. All right. The next email says, I caught your TikTok live last Friday night. You are so calming. I fell asleep. <laughs> is, is, that a, uh, is that a compliment? She says, you remind me of the late pastor, Dr. Charles Stanley. So calming, soothing, LOL. I have all the platforms, but have a lot of responsibility professionally and personally. So why that all serve as an outlet, TikTok is my go-to. Steadily growing by doing a news fusion. I basically chop up newscasts to the three to four minute nitty gritty. They tell us what they are going to tell us. They tell us, then they tell us when they told us, LOL. Sometimes I mix different newscasts to fuse the different perspectives, LOL. I'll get there with other platforms in my website one day. In the meantime, doing what you do, so many of us gain so much from you. Now it's spelled F-A-N-A-E. That's her name. Uh, I'm taking a wild guess here. Fane. Um, well, Fanea, if that's how you pronounce it, I would say this, if you're on TikTok right now, give us your handle on TikTok so I can get some of the listeners checking you out on TikTok. You want to expand that shit? You got to let me know what it is so that we can, we can send it out to uh, the folks and they can check you out. All right. The next one says, Hey, Mike, just wanted to bring up a point. I never hear you or anyone else ever talk about. MAGA insisted that we shouldn't wear masks or get vaccinations because there was no proof that these safeguards worked. Okay, fine. That's bullshit. But they're going to believe what their Lord and Savior tells them. Then they turn around and say the election was stolen, even though there's absolutely no proof that it was. Once again, Dirty Diaper Donnie said it's true, so it must be. My question is, are they really that obtuse as to not see the hypocrisy in all of this? Is it really possible to go through life with these blinders on? Didn't the good Lord give us the ability to think for ourselves? Why do so many people allow delusional, narcissistic demagogue uh, who obviously lacks fully functioning brains to do their thinking for them? Sorry, I don't really expect that you can answer these questions. Just thought I'd bring them up. Maybe some of the Trumple fucks that listen to you will wake up to the bullshit. Maybe they'll stop drinking the orange Kool-Aid. Keep up the good work, Philly Paul. Well, I don't know that there are many Trumplefucks that listen to this podcast. There may be some on um, on the video version on YouTube. I, I, I see somebody make a comment every so often. Um, but I, I was hearing somebody else talk about this very thing. How can they be so stupid when the obvious is right in front of them? And that's a good question. And the person, I can't remember who it was, but they were talking, they made an excellent point and something I've thought about before too. These people are so childish, so immature. They're willing to take something that they know is untrue in order to own the libtards. I mean, that's what we know that the Republicans do. Their whole strategy is to make Joe Biden look bad, make libtards look bad. So they will say the craziest things just to do that. That's the immaturity that we're dealing with. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some people that are just fucking stupid that don't know any better. But there are many others that do know better and do know the obvious and will do it just to trigger libtards. Well, it's not working as much as it once did anymore, and mainly because the libtards are starting to win, and Donald Trump and the Republicans are the ones that are getting triggered about everything. 
you can tell us that it's illegal to wear a mask. Um, if you can tell us that it's illegal to wear a mask, you can tell anybody that anything is illegal to wear. I mean, I thought we had the freedom to do that. But these people are so sensitive to being wrong that they want to outlaw masks. And I'll tell you this about masks. I hate masks. I don't like wearing masks. But the whole period of time during COVID that I wore a mask, never once had a cold. And that was the first time in my life that I hadn't had at least once one cold during the winter months. The masks do work. I don't like them. I won't wear them unless I absolutely have to. But if someone says you need to, to keep yourself and others safe, fuck yeah, I'm going to do it. But to suggest you can't wear a mask, that doesn't make any sense. That's contrary to the Constitution, it would seem. But that's who the Republicans are. And this is why we've got to push them out. We're going to keep getting this bullshit happening, overturning Roe v. Wade, forcing people not to wear masks and doing things against their will. They keep talking about freedom when all they really do is take away freedom. It's ironic, isn't it? Anyway, let's talk about the uh, trial yesterday. Former President Donald Trump's defense team completely, I mean, completely dropped the ball by calling Michael Cohen's former legal advisor, Robert Costello, to the witness stand, where he proceeded to call courtroom chaos and completely impeached by his own emails. Former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi explained that on CNN uh, last uh, yesterday morning. Now, in doing so, he explained Trump's team wiped the jury's doubts about Cohen's own credibility as a witness from their minds and put that suspicion on Costello. Now, Caitlin Collins on CNN asked this question. Do you think the defense ultimately made a mistake by putting Robert Costello on the witness stand and having him be the final witness instead of it being Michael Cohen yesterday, acknowledging that he stole tens of thousands of dollars from the Trump organization? Rossi says, you hit the nail on the head. Instead of focusing on Michael Cohen as a thief and a liar, they made a huge mistake. Trump's team completely bungled the key element of primacy and uh, recency, Rossi continued. You always start off strong because you only get one chance at a first impression, and people always remember your last act, he said. By calling Mr. Costello as their last witness, actually their only witness, they had a minor one, they left with the, left with the jury the following Michael Cohen said, I really didn't trust Mr. Costello. I essentially thought he was a little sleazy and that he was working for Giuliani and Trump, so I didn't want to give him anything that's going to hurt me in the end. So that's very understandable. And then when Costello took the stand, Caitlin, and uh, he acted the way he did, in my 30 to 35 years of practicing law as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, I've never seen that. He insulted the judge, and frankly, Caitlin, he insulted the jury. They may not have heard the sidebar, but remember, there are two attorneys on that jury, and they figured out why the judge had them leave the room, and it was because of decorum, said Rossi. The defense ended on a horrible, horrible note, and it washed away everything they were trying to do with Michael Cohen. And here's the kicker. They actually rehabilitated Michael Cohen because Mr. Costello did come across a little unsavory. And that's exactly what happened. Michael Cohen thought he might be working with Giuliani and Donald Trump, so he's not going to tell him anything if he suspects them of that. And then the emails come out that specifically state that that's exactly what he was doing. He was working as an agent for Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani. He was trying to get a hold of Michael Cohen and control him, much like they tried to do with Hope Hicks during the January 6th hearing. Remember, she had a Trump-paid attorney, and then she fired him and said, I'm going to do this on my own because I want to tell the truth. This is exactly what Donald Trump and Giuliani was trying to do to Michael Cohen. They knew he was dangerous, so they were trying to control him, try to 
keep the information flowing to Giuliani and Trump so they could deal with him, have leverage over Michael Cohen. But Michael Cohen was too smart. He recognized that this guy is an unsavory motherfucker. And to be honest with you, you don't have to be brilliant to do that. All you have to do is look at this motherfucker. He is a grimy, slimy, shyster of a lawyer. And he's sitting there, and I have to question well, I don't think it's perjury what he did because Michael Cohen said he didn't have anything on Donald Trump in his place that was um, uh, raided. Um, but he knew he didn't want to tell Donald Trump anything, get him any information so that it may come back to hurt him. And that's why Robert Costello didn't heard what he heard. You know, I've said this about Donald Trump. Just let him talk. He will fuck it up. He will implicate himself. But the same seems to be the case for his attorneys. From the beginning, they have fucked up. They put Michael Cohen on the stand. They figure they're going to rile him up and get him to get, act crazy, and he doesn't. He readily admits that he stole money from Donald Trump and that he lied but it doesn't matter because that really has nothing to do with the case. The only thing they were trying to accomplish was to discredit Michael Cohen. And that's fine. But the fact of the matter is everything Michael Cohen said was already corroborated with the likes of David Pecker or Hope Hicks or any of the others. So they were just trying to tie together that information. They can look at Michael Cohen as a potential liar, but they know these other people said the same thing, so it has some credibility. The only thing that Donald Trump's legal team could do was bring this guy on the witness stand, and that was a risk. I have a feeling that was a Donald Trump choice because the emails that implicate him as an agent to Donald Trump and uh, Rudy Giuliani were there. The defense knew the prosecution had that. They knew this was coming, but they still put him up anyway. That's just flat out stupid, or they're just doing Donald Trump's bidding the way Donald Trump wants it done. So for all the people that were whining and crying and saying, oh, my God, Michael Cohen fucked it up. We're going to lose the case. That's bullshit. And I told you that before this guy even stepped on the witness stand. Prosecution is a smart group of people. Alvin Bragg is no fucking dummy. Everything he did, I'm sure he knew how it was going to work out. He knew that they would either call no witnesses, which would have been the smart move for the defense, wrap it up with Michael Cohen, as uh, this Rossi said, leave it on a high note for the defense, but they couldn't help themselves. And why? Well, because Donald Trump is all about, let's go in there and fight, let's tear him up. And he's reckless, and he's reactionary, and he's emotional. So he puts this guy up thinking he could slip this one through. But as I said, the prosecution, Elvin Bragg, they're smarter than that. Donald Trump and his legal team didn't have a prayer from the moment they stepped into court. Remember, this Todd Blanche is supposed to be a credible lawyer, but he's never been a defense lawyer. He's been a prosecutor. And he's shown us in this whole trial, he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And and this other woman, Necklace, she makes a fool out of herself too. And really the big problem for them is if they were able to do what they know how to do, things would go better for them. But that's not how Donald Trump does business. Donald Trump tells them what they need to do. He wants them to fight. He wants them to be outrageous. He wants them to behave like Robert Costello did. But Donald Trump doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. So Robert Costello behaves like this. He gets admonished by uh, Judge Juan Marchand and destroys his credibility in front of the jury and in the judge. So they could have ended with Michael Cohen, but they couldn't help themselves. They had to bring this fucking clown in, and they made this whole situation far worse for them than they, they originally had. Now, the thing about it is, is that there are those people, oh, my God, what's going to happen? I know what's going to happen. He's going to get convicted of um, 
maybe all 34 charges, because if one is bad, one is guilty, all the rest are going to be guilty too. And if he gets convicted of 34 felony charges, people say, well, he'll just get probation or something. I'm not so sure about that. If he had one or two counts, yeah, maybe he would get probation because he's a white collar criminal. But if you have 34 felonies, that says something entirely different. This suggests this guy is a very prolific, if not habitual criminal. And that would call for something more than probation. So he's put himself in a situation that it seems inevitable that he will have to do some jail time. Now, he won't necessarily run off to jail the moment he gets convicted because he'll make appeals and do all that sort of stuff, and he might delay it. But don't worry about that. Whether he's in jail or not doesn't make as much difference because the important thing is that we have convictions. Donald Trump is a convicted felon, and if he has 30 or 34 of them, all the better. This changes the entire paradigm. This changes his head. This changes the perception of voters. This changes the perception of Democrats and Republicans. That is the beginning of the absolute end for Donald Trump because he can't come back from that. He certainly is not going to appeal it and remedy the situation before the election. He's going to be a convict going into the election, if he even makes it to the election. So this is all good news. And anybody worried about how this trial was going to end up? Just watch. Just fucking watch. It's going to be bad for Donald Trump. All right. We are going to take a quick break, and we will be right back. All right. After Robert Costello got on the witness stand for the defense and destroyed himself and destroyed the whole case for the defense, the defense team, Todd Blanche and his team, rested their case. They were done. It's all over. All over except uh, the rules for the uh, uh, jury and the final arguments, which will come next Tuesday. But wait. They forgot something. Donald Trump said he would testify, but they rested the case before Donald Trump testified. So he's not testifying. Donald Trump said he was going to testify, but somehow he's not. Could it be that he's finally listening to his lawyers or is that he's a pussy ass bitch and he's a coward? I think it could be a little bit of both. I have to wonder, had Robert Costello done better on the stand, if Donald Trump might have taken the stand? But he saw what happened to Robert Costello, and he knew he was in trouble, and he knew he was probably going to get the same treatment, which he would have. Taking the stand would have been the dumbest thing that Donald Trump would ever do. And the only thing that's close to the dumbest thing of him testifying was having Robert Costello testify. They weren't going to do two dumb things in a row, and I guess the lawyers implored him to not do it. So Donald Trump did not testify Tuesday for his defense. They rested the Manhattan hush money trial. Um, one of his former lawyers suggested it could be due to exhaustion. Oh, your life's on the line. You might go to prison. I should testify, but I'm really tired. Motherfucker sleeps through the entire trial. His eyes are closed through the whole trial. How is he tired? Trump has spent much of the trial falling asleep or closing his eyes during proceedings, but several times he has said that he wants to defend himself and pledge to testify. Now, critics have accused him of cowardice for reneging on that promise. Even when speaking to the press outside the courtroom Tuesday, Trump claimed he might still speak out despite his chance to take the stand has now passed. Well, of course he is. He's going to say anything he can do to divert, distract, or delay. He goes on to say, why would I take a, the chance? But 
We do want to defend our Constitution, so at some point, maybe I will take the chance, Trump told reporters. Yeah, on Truth Social, where you don't have to be under oath or be questioned by people that might be adversarial, you pussy-ass bitch. Now, this sent MSNBC host to ask former Trump lawyer William Brennan why he declined to address the jury. Brendan said, I mean, number one, he doesn't have to. That's what the constitutional protections are all about. But the anchors were curious about why he refused to testify, but why he wouldn't give a reason when the press asked. He said, I mean, it's easy to come up with the bombast before the trial, Brennan said, but when you're in the midst of this was a fairly long trial for misdemeanors and possibly a felony, he's probably tired at this point and just doesn't have to is the short answer. Trump has frequently made fun of President Joe Biden calling him Sleepy Joe and implying that he's too old to be in office. Comedians and pundits rushed to mock Trump as he fell asleep in his own criminal trial. Now, this Brennan obviously is a Trump humper. It's just misdemeanors. Well, it's not just misdemeanors. They are misdemeanors in the actual acts but if they're done in conjunction with try to affect or interfere with an election, there's where the felonies come in. And that is what the prosecution has proved. So while he's trying to poo-poo this, this fucking clown knows better. And Donald Trump was tired. When have you ever seen Donald Trump tired, too tired to talk? Most of us get tired of listening to his bullshit. Donald Trump never gets tired when it comes to talking, especially if he's trying to defend himself. He knew he would get destroyed if he went on the witness stands. The lawyers knew that for sure. Everybody knew it. It wasn't until the last minute that Donald Trump finally realized, well, I'm a cowardice motherfucker, so I'm not going to do it. That's fine, Donnie. It doesn't matter. You're still going to get convicted. Now, one of Donnie's close buddies had a little, a short time in court today, too. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani complained Tuesday after being ordered to put up collateral for a $10,000 secure bond in an Arizona case about fake electors. You heard the story that he got an indictment. He was trying to hide from the indictment. He was bragging about how he was hiding from the indictment. And then as he walked off a stage during a birthday party in West Palm Beach, there were two guys handing him his, his paperwork. So he had to go to Arizona, plead not guilty, as well as a bunch of other people. There's like 10 people, uh, some names we've heard before, uh, that pled not guilty. And he had to put up a $10,000 bond. That's not a lot of money for a rich guy like Rudy Giuliani, except for the fact is he ain't rich anymore because of the $178 million lawsuit that he lost to those two women in Georgia. Now, soon after appearing remotely before a judge in Maricopa County, he actually didn't go to Arizona. He did it on Zoom or something. Giuliani spoke on his podcast about the requirement for a bond as he faces bankruptcy proceedings. Arizona officials alleged Giuliani participated in a scheme to overturn the 2020 president, presidential electors, uh, presidential fake electors in Arizona. This isn't a federal case. This is just in the state of Arizona. It's much like what, what we're seeing in Georgia. He said, you don't bring a case like this if you're not crooked, he said of the prosecution. You got to show I'm a, I'll cheat for Biden, too. I mean, you did a pretty damn good job on the election of cheating and the next election, too. So he's still denying the election while there's never been any proof of it. Uh, but he's whining now that he had to put up $10,000. Well, <laughs> Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. I think Beretta said that in the 70s. The judge set a $10,000 bail for me because I'm going to run away, he told his audience. No, it was to screw me because I made it difficult for them to find me. Why, why did you do that? If you're innocent, why would you hide from them? Silly. 
Giuliani uh, disputed the notion that he was challenging to find. Now, think about the idiocy of, idiocy of it, he said. I've been prosecuted in Atlanta. I've shown up every time. I'm sued by all kinds of people. I showed up for my trial where the verdict took place. There's no history of any kind of bail risk. Yeah, but didn't you brag that they were having trouble finding you and they haven't served you yet and that they had to do it by the next day? Otherwise, you'd get off somehow. Well, they found you on that day. You are a risk. I mean, not just for the case in Arizona, for the situation um, in Georgia, you know, where you owe $178 million and ten thousand dollars that's not a lot of money if you get a bail bondsman what do you pay ten percent on that so you got to come up with a thousand bucks out of your pocket that ain't shit why are you whining about it so they had to have a ten thousand dollar bail just for punitive reasons he added this again proof that this is completely political prosecution rudy you got to learn when not to open your fucking mouth it's gotten you in trouble. It's cost you $178 million, yet you keep fucking yapping. Now, Giuliani has said that he's not guilty of any crimes, of course. Um, Giuliani has said that he's not guilty of any crimes, uh, but he's going to go on trial in Georgia. We don't know how quickly that's going to happen, but, you know, he's 80 years old. He's not in the best health. He's broke as a bitch. Who knows if he makes it to court? I don't know. <laughs> but Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump, they thought they had the world by the ass. How are they feeling now? Donald Trump's on the verge of getting multiple felony convictions. Rudy Giuliani is out $178 million. He's going to go to court in Arizona. And I have a feeling that Rudy Giuliani may be one of those superseding indictments coming out of uh, Jack Smith's office after the election. Oh, the troubles have just begun for Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump. There's more to come. And even after this election, we are going to be hearing about court cases and problems and whining and pissing and moaning by these two and others, of course. For years, literally two, three, four years, this is going to be going on. The only thing about it is, is that after the election, they will have no power. They won't even probably have a platform. They'll be ignored. Oh, some people like the Fox Newses and the tabloid uh, media will bring them up just for the scandal of it all, just for the noise of it all. But in terms of real protection or power that Donald Trump is getting now by being a presidential candidate, that will be gone. They will both be fucked. Donald Trump, especially. All right. Talking about dipshits, let's talk about Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. She donned her tinfoil hat and took to Twitter, get this now, to claim that President Joe Biden was planning to assassinate former President Donald Trump. Where the fuck do you get that from? Trump emerged from his criminal trial in New York on Tuesday, where he faces the 34 counts. After court adjourned for the day, the ex-president spoke to reporters and again slammed the case against him. He continued his tirade on True Social, where he baselessly claimed the Department of Justice authorized the FBI to use deadly lethal force during the FBI's execution of a search warrant on his property in August of 2022. Well, then why didn't they do it? The search turned up boxes of government documents Trump took with him after leaving office. Uh, Green seized on Trump's wild accusation because she believes whatever her Lord and Savior always says, even though we know he's a pathological liar. She asserted that the Biden administration tried to kill the former president. She even took credit for Trump's claim by suggesting she told him about the alleged plot. Wow. Wow. I made sure that he knew, she wrote on social media. The Biden DOJ and FBI were planning to assassinate President Trump and gave the green light. Does everyone get it yet? What are Republicans going to do about it? 
I tried to oust our speaker who funded Biden's DOJ and FBI, but Democrats stopped it. This is a little bit of a stretch, but I know where it comes from. There's a bill that I think Clyburn put up in the House or is going to put up in the House that says that if a president is convicted of a crime, that they would take away his secret service, which makes some sense. And I'm sure they're taking that and trying to turn this into an assassination attempt. Now, in April, Green told conspiracy theorist Alex Jones that Democrats might be looking to off Trump. They want President Trump dead, she said. They want to lock him up in jail for the rest of his life so that he dies in jail. Well, which one is it? We want him dead or we want him to die in jail years from now? I've said this many times. Once Donald Trump is convicted of all his crimes, I hope he lives a long and healthy life behind fucking bars. Last thing I want to see is him become a martyr. And that's what he would become to a small faction of people anyway. Uh, they want to take away his Secret Service protection. See what I'm saying? That's that's where this is coming from. And hope that he is murdered somewhere in jail, possibly. This is how serious they are. Assassinating a political rival would be frowned upon in the United States, though Trump's own attorneys have argued in federal court that doing so could hypothetically fall within the scope of a president's powers. Well, according to Donald Trump, Biden has every right to do it and would not be held responsible for it with total immunity. You know, that total immunity isn't going to be given to Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's absolutely ridiculous. And what's even more ridiculous is that the Supreme Court has decided to do Donald Trump's bidding and delay an obvious answer to a stupid question. Now, here's something interesting. We we're talking about the classified documents. Court documents revealed on Tuesday that former President Donald Trump's lawyers found additional classified documents in his bedroom some four months, four months after the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago to retrieve documents. Now, the FBI searched Trump's residence in August of 2022 after his lawyers gave a certified letter to authorities claiming there were no more documents on the property, despite the National Archives still asking for specific materials. They knew what was missing. They said, you got to have them. And he says, nope, don't have them. Don't have them. So they come in, they raid his house, and, or they search his house, and they grab all the stuff that they can find. And even still, four months later, there's more classified documents. Now, I'm sure at that point, the lawyers were a little nervous, knowing that they might search the place again. And if they find them after they've told the FBI that that's all we got, there might be some problems for lawyers. There still might be some problems for lawyers. Now, we know that uh, the classified documents has been postponed as the judge he appointed sorts through a multitude of pretrial motions, which are all Donald Trump's uh, pretrial motions in order to delay this thing. And as I've told you, don't worry about that so much. Let's get through this trial. Next week, we'll be done with it. Then we can focus on Georgia, Florida, or D.C. Take it one step at a time. But once he gets those convictions in this trial, things about to change. Politico's Kyle Cheney noted how Tuesday's news became public, writing that the revelation was among several cited by U.S. District Judge Beryl Howell in a newly unsealed 2023 opinion that found prosecutors had presented compelling evidence that Trump knowingly stashed national security documents in his home and then tried to conceal them when the Justice Department tried to retrieve them. That's why I always say they always want to compare what happened with Joe Biden to what happened with Donald Trump. There were classified documents in Donald Trump's home or in Joe Biden's home and some office, but he readily gave them back. He apologized and he gave them back. Donald Trump took these when he left the White House, hid them. When asked for them, he said, no, I don't have them. When the FBI came to search it, his place, he still hid more. 
you can see the difference here, the, the criminal aspect of Donald Trump. Now, notably, no excuses provided as to how the former president could miss the classified mark documents found in his bedroom at Mar-a-Lago, Howell wrote in the opinion from last year. Cheney added that Howell's opinion included some of the bombshells. In a footnote, Howell also noted that another Trump advisor connected to his Save America PAC had acknowledged scanning the contents of the box that contained the classified materials in 2021 and storing them on a personal laptop provided by the PAC. Cheney reported adding Trump's office provided the box that contained the four records to the FBI in January of 2023. So that means Donald Trump did, in fact, disseminate this to somebody else. It doesn't matter who it was. That's illegal. And then the guy who scanned them and put them on his personal laptop, a la Hunter Biden, presumably did something with it, too, and potentially uh, disseminated it. And see, that's that's the problem. We don't know what damage has come from this. We don't know who's made money off this information and who they sent it to. Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, North Korea. I don't care where they sent it, but they didn't take it just to collect it like baseball cars. They knew it had value. They knew it was worth something. So when Donald Trump took them or whoever he disseminated them to, they knew there was some value. And it's crazy to think that they didn't use them to enrich themselves. Now, in that case, Donald Trump is facing 37 counts, federal indictments for his retention of classified documents and alleged schemes to retain them despite authorities demanding their return. The indictment includes a transcript of Trump on tape allegedly waving around a top secret war plan in front of a ghostwriter and acknowledging the document was not declassified when asked. He fucking confesses right on audio tape. Yet that judge down in Florida wants to delay it because she's not sure. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, why hasn't Jack Smith done something yet? And you're right. I think that, too. But I'm not Jack Smith. I'm not as smart as Jack Smith. The idea that Jack Smith is just going to let this fly I find that hard to believe. But as I told you, in this particular trial, once he's a convicted felon, this weakens Donald Trump in so many ways. It's going to put pressure on the judge down in Florida, too. She's hoping to save Donald Trump. But by the time he's convicted in the Manhattan district, he's not savable. He's already damaged goods. He's already finished. I think Jack Smith will probably push forward at some time after this trial to straighten things out with uh, Judge Cannon. The only thing that can be done with her is get her off the case, recuse her from this case, maybe get her off the bench altogether. This woman is not only corrupt and biased, she's clearly stupid. She doesn't know the job she's doing. Now, Donald Trump said something. Well, he didn't actually say it. He reposted a video, and Joe Biden slammed Donald Trump over the former president's social media post touting a unified Reich as a la the Third Reich. Why would he use that word? There are many synonyms for Reich, a town, an empire. There's all kinds of ways to say it, but he chose to repost the Reich. Now, clearly, he got a lot of shit about it because of the Nazi connotation. On Monday, Trump posted the now deleted videos on True Social and Instagram showing fictional newspaper reports about Trump winning November's election. The paper, which is based on a downloadable template, included placeholder headlines such as items about Bosnia and Her Herzegovina and the European great powers. More jarringly, however, one headline touted a unified Reich. Predictably, the post sparked outrage and Trump campaign distanced itself from them. But he posted it. He reposted the motherfucker. 
You mean to tell me that nobody thought, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea, but Donald Trump did it. That, they have no control over Donald Trump. Donald Trump does whatever he wants, and they are made to clean up the mess afterwards. Now, they say this was not a campaign video, Trump campaign spokesperson Caroline Leavitt said. It was created by a random account online and reposted by a staffer who clearly did not see the word while the president was in court. Oh, yeah. Blame it on somebody else. Want to bet? Want to bet that a staffer posted it? Now, at a fundraiser in Boston on Tuesday, Biden ripped his predecessor. He said, this is Hitler's language, not America's, the president said, according to Reuters. White House correspondent Nandita Rose. Biden added that Trump is a little unhinged right now because he's still grappling with his election loss in 2020. Earlier, White House spokesperson Andrew Bates similarly blasted Trump. They keep making mistakes. As I said, let them talk. Let them do whatever they fucking want to do. Because Donald Trump will always implicate himself. He'll make it worse. And he did. Now, um, Biden says it is abhorrent, sickening, and disgraceful for anyone to promote content associated with Germany's Nazi government under Adolf Hitler, he said in a statement. Any anti-Semitic dog whistling is dangerous and offensive and profoundly un-American. Now, we've got um, allegedly some debates coming up as quickly as June 27th and, of course, the election in November. You think this is going to come up in the debate if Donald Trump even shows up? I'm still not convinced he will. He'll find a way to uh, weasel his way out of it. Now, we're still waiting on what's going on with uh, Georgia's case and Fonnie Willis. Um, They wanted to recuse Fonnie Willis from being on this case It was appealed to the judge. The judge said, nah, it's fine. And then they appealed it to a higher court. So everything's kind of in a holding pattern at this point. Still kind of a holding pattern. But what's interesting is that in the process, Fonnie Willis is up for re-election. Now, the Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who's looking into the Donald Trump said thing, was in a primary on the 21st yesterday, and she won her Democratic primary by a lot. She will be the Democratic candidate for district attorney. And because it's Fulton County and it ties in Atlanta, it's a very blue area of Georgia, and she's expected to win that easily. They ain't getting rid of her that quick. Willis faced a challenge from a Democratic Christian Wise Smith a former prosecutor in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Willis also beat him when she ran for a position the first time in 2020. Now, Willis is expected to take on Republican Courtney Kramer, a former legal intern in the Trump administration and former litigation consultant to the Trump campaign after the 2020 election. Uh, Listen to that again. A former legal intern in the Trump administration and a consultant, a litigation consultant in the Trump campaign after the 2020 election. This person isn't even a fucking lawyer at this point. How do you think Fonnie Willis is going to do? She's going to kick this bitch's ass. If it's, if it's a woman or, or I don't know who it is, Courtney in the South, it could be anybody. Now, given Fulton County's heavily Democratic leanings, Willis is considered the heavy favorite in November. Now, in addition to that, this is ironic. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee, the one overseeing the Georgia trial, um, also won his race, his primary for re-election, according to Decision Desk HQ. Now, McAfee fended off a challenge from civil rights attorney Robert Patil, Uh, retaining his seat on the Superior Court. He's overseeing a case launched by Fulton County District Attorney Bonnie Willis. McAfee became a household name, particularly after issuing a decision to allow Willis to remain on the Trump case. He said it's fine for her to stay. They appealed it to a higher court. 
he did suggest that Nathan Wade, the gentleman that was supposed to be um, Fonnie Willis's boyfriend, he had to be removed, and he was. Members of both parties expected McAfee to survive the challenge to his reelection bid, and the judge enjoyed endorsements from Republicans and Democrats, including Governor Brian Kemp and former Governor Roy Barnes. All right, we're coming to the end. A Republican Jasmine, or Representative Jasmine Crockett. She's not a Republican. She's a Democrat. <laughs> you like this story. Representative Jasmine Crockett could soon claim ownership of the jab she hurled at Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene in an epic clash during the House Oversight Accountability Committee hearing last week. You remember... She, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, called Jasmine Crockett out for her fake eyelashes, alleged fake eyelashes. And in response, Jasmine Crockett suggested that um, Marjorie Taylor Greene was a bleach blonde, bad built butch body. <laughs> and that kind of went viral. You see those hashtags all over the place. Well, she has an application, Jasmine Crockett does, for Bleach Blonde Bad Built Butch, Butch Body. It was filed by Crockett's campaign Sunday with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. USA Today was first to report the news of the trademark application. Don't blame her a bit. Absolutely. You own that shit. You should legally own it. The move comes after the 43-year-old lawmaker launched what she dubbed a Crockett Clapback Collection last week that included a T-shirt bearing the same alliterative insult that she used during her contentious exchange with Green. This is going to piss Green off. Now, Green told Crockett, I think your fake eyelashes are messing you up what you're reading. Later in the hearing, Crockett asked what she described as a hypothetical question about what might violate congressional protocol. She said, I'm just curious, just to better understand your ruling, Crockett said, referring to a decision made by James Comer. Supposing if someone on this committee then starts talking about somebody's bleach, blonde, bad, built, butch body, that would not be engaging in personalities, correct? Crockett said in... Uh, kind of a slightly veiled barb. Crockett's office and a campaign representative didn't return requests for comment about any trademark plans. Green defended her physique in a video posted to social media saying, yes, my body is built and strong, not with nips, tucks, plastic, or silicone, but through a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, bitch, but what about your face? <laughs> what about your fucking face? You know, it's it's, it's not the right thing to, to uh, shame somebody's face or shame somebody's body. But when it's somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene who does the things she does, it's okay. It's okay to do that. That Neanderthal-looking bitch, she is unattractive inside and out. And I hope... Uh, Miss Crockett gets the trademark and makes a shitload of money off of the um, insult to Marjorie Taylor Greene. That would add insult to injury. Marjorie's having a tough few months, the last few. All right. We are going to wrap up the Rational Boomer podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen. I hope you have a great day, and we will talk to you again tomorrow.